O Lord, raise up, we pray thee, thy power, and come among us with thy great might, and succor us, that whereas through our sins and wickedness we are let and hindered in running the race that is set before us, thy bountiful grace and mercy may speedily help and deliver us through the satisfaction of thy Son, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory. Old without end. Amen. And now for a favorite. Verse 474. When I survey the wondrous cross where the young prince of glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt of all my pride. We now turn to Monsignor Horace K. Mann's The Life of Popes, or volume six is 18, actually 19 volumes, but one through 18 with two parts for one, so 19 total, but volumes one through 18 were on six, dealing with Leo IX to Honorarius II, 1049 to 1130, so the 11th and early 12th century. <sighs> Scrolling through some pages here. Hopefully, we do have a preface. By way of preface to this additional series of the lives of popes in the Middle Ages, which is now offered to the public, I will simply say, in the words of an old Norse monk who wrote the history of the kings of his country, it may be taken as certain that I wish that someone other than myself had undertaken to tell the story of these events. But as this task has not yet been attempted, I prefer to make the attempt myself rather than it should be made at all. Now he thanks all these different people and libraries, which is ever important. Librarians and archivists are always wonderful people. A list of abbreviations. <sighs> Table of contents, introductory chapter. Leo 9, 1049 to 1054, <clears throat> Victorious 2, 1055 to 57, Steve, Stephen 9, 10, and we're all messed up on the numbers because of the anti pope game, 1057, 1058, Nicholas 2, 1059 to 1061, Alexander 2, 1061 to 73. Appendix 1, the sources of Icelandic history. Appendix 2, the dukes and kings of Croatia, Dalmatia. List of us, illustrations, map of Italy, courtyard of Salerno Cathedral, I've been there. Pope granting a privilege, coin of Leo IX, Countess Matilda, signatures of Abbot Desiderius and Hildebrand. Castle of San Angelo. The, the century of papal history, which it is hoped will be illustrated in the following pages, was the age dominated by the name of Hildebrand, and hence it is often called, described as the Cyculum Hildebrandicum. It was the age in which that high-minded and pure-souled monk strove, either by his own exertions or those which he inspired to promote that reform in the church which had been inaugurated by Leo the Ninth. The efforts at reform took the shape of a determined struggle against the triple scourge of simony clerical incontinence and tyrannical interference in the powerful domain of the church 
and were focused in the fight against lay investiture. But the attempt to stifle this abuse, which was begun under the saintly pontiff from Lorraine, was not destined to be concluded either in his reign during which Hildebrand was trained or in those of his immediate successors who were under the influence of Hildebrand or in that of Hildebrand himself. It was not to be determined till the pontificate of Calixtus II, while the general contest between the papacy and the empire took its rise in this attempt at reform, was to last till the 15th century and was in the temporal order to exhaust both. Reforming zeal of the popes of the school of Hildebrand almost everywhere encountered the most stubborn opposition. So deep rooted, rooted were the evils they strove to eradicate. So dear were they to the passions of the clergy or to the interests of the great. And nowhere did they meet with greater opposition than in Italy. If simony or simony was rife in France, it was worse in Germany and worst of all in Italy. And if the spectacle of married priests and bishops was not uncommon in other countries of Europe, it was no more, nowhere more obvious than in Italy and especially in Milan and in Lombardy generally. The reason of this is not far to seek. <clears throat> the re though the church in Italy, especially in its northern portion, had, owing to the power of its bishops and to the comparatively rare interfering visits of German pro emperors, had been free very lar to a large extent from the royal oppression which, under which it groaned in other countries. It had become thoroughly demoralized by the terrible anarchy of the 10th century, and its bishops were, for the most part, as loose in their morals as their secular compeers. What does this do to apostolic succession there, old boys? Though then the fight for independence and reform upon which the popes had entered was to be long and bitter and was to bring on them a very large share of suffering from the Franconian emperors and their contemptible anti-popes. They were not to stand alone in the combat. The words of such fiery champions of reform as Peter Damien must never be taken too literally. There were always good priests and even good bishops, and that too in Italy, who were longing for a reformation of manners was it just manners? What about doctrine? And who were only waiting for an opportunity to help promote it, especially were the popes supported, supported by the religious orders, by the Kamal Elise, founded by Romold 1009, and the Primunt Strat Tensians 1125, and especially by the Benedictines revived by the reforms of Cluny, and by those of the Carthusians, 1084, and Cistercians, 1098. Got a lot of sex there, you guys. You know, hear a lot of noise about these Protestant sects. And from such centers as Beck and Cl Clairvaux, men like Lanfranc and Anselm and Bernard, they were sustained also in their conflict against the powers of evil men, deservedly conspicuous for their sanctity by Peter Damien, Bruno Senyi, John Gualbert with his order of Volumbrosa, by St. Bruno with his Carthusians who by their silence and penitential life protest against the disorders of the age. The era of which we are about now to write in detail was not an era of ardent work for reform, but of great and glorious deeds, the soul of which was faith, both 
in the social and political, as well as in the ecclesiastical order. It was the age in which the Crescent began its steady decline before the cross. It saw the birth of the Crusades. Quote, the Lord's doing a wonder unknown to preceding ages and reserved for our days, closed quote. It was a time wherein, owing to the spread of the work of the truce of God, and then to the departure of much of its warlike element to the east, there was, in spite of feudalism, greater peace in Europe. Under its blessed shadow, learning at once revived. Webert, abbot of Nogent, 1124, assures us that wandering clerklings of modern times are more learned than the professed grammarians in this time of his boyhood or immediately before it. <clears throat> Towards the end of the 11th century, France and Provencal poetry made their appearance, and the parent of modern literature is said to have been the Frenchman William of Portiers, the chaplain of William the Conqueror. It was at this same time that the Moors in Spain began their final retreat before the arms of Christians. The great legendary hero of Spain, Roderick Diaz de Bivar, the Cid, died in 1099, and it is far from unlikely that the Castilian muse was, within 50 years of his death, busy with the rich verses of Poema del Cid, or with the first mystery plays, the Mysterio de los Reyes Magos. Side by side with the lighter forms of learning, there has got a picture here. A Salerno Cathedral. Huh. It's, it's twisted on the side. There sprang into activity the more serious figures of law, medicine, philosophy, and theology. As early as 1050, Salerno was known throughout Europe as a great school of medicine and by his studies on Roman law in Arius, 1113, was to render Bologna forever famous as a primary font of legal learning. And whilst he and his successors in the teaching of civil, civil law, by their study of the digest and the other jurisprudence of Justinian, were to give intellectual support to their absolutism, Deus Dedit, who wrote in 1087, and the other canonists, of the latter part of the 11th century, and particularly Gratian, with his immortal decree in 1142, were to give no little help to the cause of popes and to civilization generally. And if John Damascene and John the Scot are remote ancestors of scholasticism, Rosclin, 1106, Anselm of Canterbury, William of Champeaux, 1121, and Abelard, 1142, are its immediate parents. The ages wherein men had been content to gather up and reproduce the traditionary wisdom of the fathers had passed away, and the powers of reason were to be used to inquire into and systematize the masses of theological troops, truths gathered, grouped together by the patient labor of beads and alcuins. The appearance of scholastic theology shows us that this age possessed an increased scientific knowledge of God and of the truths of God, the revival of art, math, in connection with church building and decoration, which took place during it is evidence enough of an increase of devout feeling for the things of God. In every country, we find architectural masterpieces arising, which have excited the admiration of every succeeding age 
that has itself been blessed with any degree of enlightenment. What Raoul Gleber tells us of the remarkable increase in church building during this epoch is abundantly borne out by what is known of the history of the great European ecclesiastical structures. <clears throat> France saw the rising of the great cathedrals of Atun, 1060, Cahors, 1096, Chartres, 1108, Evreux, 1112, Léon, 1114. In this country of her modern ally, the erection of churches at Novgorod, 1056, Kiev, 1075, and Skoff, 1158, is recorded. In England, most of our cathedrals date back to this age, as in Scotland, New Glasgow Cathedral. 1123, and the Abbey Churches of Kelso and Waverley, 1128, as in Ireland, do St. Patrick's Cathedral, Dublin, 1090, and King Cormac's Chapel in Cashel, 1127. Many a cathedral, too, in Germany. Italy and Spain can proudly trace back its origins to this remote period, as even Canlund, 1072, and West Taurus, 1100 in Sweden, and Roskilde, 1084 in Denmark. So great was the zeal for the erection of magnificent churches that in many instances, existing buildings were pulled down in order that they might be rebuilt in what was regarded as a more perfect style. It was to this impulse in this great period of Romanesque architecture that we owe many of the existing Romanesque cathedrals. And just as many a basilica had in this age to give place to a Romanesque cathedral, so in the next many Romanesque building, especially a Romanesque cathedral of Chartres, was leveled to the ground that the present Gothic structure might, on the same site, raise its noble front to the glory of God on high. But building the beautiful churches were not the only buildings which graced the Gregorian revival. It is only distinguished by the erection of edifices <clears throat> of all kind for the benefit of the energetic or the consolation of the suffering. We find this biographer outing with regard to John Gualbert, 1073, that he was a great builder, bridge builder, and founder of hospitals throughout the whole of Tuscany. The winter of the early Middle Ages with its darkness and its violent storms had gone and their springtime had come. With bursting growth and gladdened with fresh life, even if troubled by violent winds and sweeping showers. Turning our eyes from the West in general to Italy, the more immediate field of papal labor, labor we are at once struck with the fact that the three empires, which in the last epoch were so vigorously contending for the possession of its fair form are now fading from our shores. The power of the Saracen Empire declined everywhere before the close of the 10th century. At the beginning of the 11th century, it had no permanent centers of aggression on the mainland of South Italy and was being taught by bitter experience the might of the new maritime powers of Venice and Pisa. Even its predatory incursions became less as the century advanced. The same age saw the disappearance from the peninsula of the more disciplined troops of Constantinople. Their occupation of southern Italy, begun by the capture of Bari in 876, was brought to a close by their expulsion from it 
by the Normans in 1071. And if the rights of the German Empire were not yet to be extinguished in northern Italy, the rise of the people and communes of free birds, which was to prove fatal to them, had already begun, so that during the epoch, southern Italy became rapidly more and more Norman. Northern Italy made steady progresses, advances towards becoming the land of free cities. In central Italy, especially through the donation of the Countess Matilda, fell more than ever under the direct influence of the temporal sovereignty of the popes. It is, however, owing to the great dearth of documentary evidence, very difficult to say what was the precise extent of the papal domination at the opening of this epoch. In theory, at least, the states of the church were as extensive as ever, and by the junction of them of Benevenuto, Benevento, 1051 might even seem to actually be, de facto, more extensive than ever. But though it is true that Otho I renewed the donations of the Carolingians, the effective control of the popes over their states was rather diminished and increased by that sovereign and his immediate successors. They protected the exarchate of Ravenna in the name of the Pope <coughs> in their own name, despite the protests of the Pope, <coughs> disposed the territories to men of their own choice. Even in the Duchy of Rome, the power of the Popes, like that of other sovereigns of the West, was very largely controlled by the feudal rights and customs which had been usurped by the nobility and what had befallen the sovereign claims of the popes during the Rome's dark ages had also to a very large extent overtaken their own ownership rights. Their privy purse had become as empty as their state treasury. We have, or we should, soon shall have seen the low ebb at which Stephen 5 slash 6 and St. Leo not found the papal finances. To restore them, we shall find the popes of this period endeavoring to develop comparatively fresh resources of revenues during this century in which they lost the patrimonies of the church. The monasteries of Europe had begun to pay them taxes in return for privileges. And what is a privilege that they get out of paying a tax to the Pope? <laughs> the English had set the example to other countries of paying to the Popes the voluntarily imposed tax of Peter's Pence. We shall see Alexander II and Gregory VII urging its regular payment on William the Conqueror as the former had already done on the king of Denmark. We need not then begin to think of greed of gold or lust of power when the efforts of Gregory and other popes of this period to obtain money or to extend their regal authority are brought to our notice. Oh, really, Horace, as long as could be done without money in the Middle Ages as now, and both gold and temporal authority were required by popes if, especially in an age of violence, they were to be in possession to exercise the charity of the priest and to preserve in any way the dignity and independence befitting the head of the church. That's a, that is a pile. There's a castle of nonsense. He's hiding in it. During the seculum, Hildebrand had come, the position of the popes improved not only from a pecuniary point of view and with regard to their real authority over their states generally, but also in the matter of their control over the turbulent Romans. 
owing to the collapse of the Byzantine power before the arms of the Lombards, civil authority at Rome had fallen into the hands of the popes by default and had practically remained there during the 7th, 8th, and 9th centuries. But during the 8th century, owing to the establishment of a local militia, a military aristocracy had begun to be formed, which, of course, increased in importance when the popes became temporal rulers and had more wealth and lucrative positions at their disposal. And here we go, money. I almost have to be an economist. Verse 2 of Him 474, Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the cross of Christ. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. Let us pray. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. God's speed.